Thank you, Jared, for that introduction. Um, <clears throat> tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, this topic, Is It Rational to Believe in Anything Other Than Science? And that's kind of a provocative title. And I, I chose it because you meet so many people who, just on the street who say, I only believe things that are based on evidence. I don't know about you religious people. And so, so I, we want to address that specific sort of attitude that's, that permeates the culture. Um, already some of you may be saying, is this going to be like one of those PowerPoint presentations that professors love to give with outlines and everything? Uh, yes, yeah, sadly. Um, so, <laughs> so for the note takers of the world, God bless you, number one. Um, uh, so we're going to hit kind of, th I have three main topics I'm going, to get, I'm going to get to tonight. We'll spend by far the most time on the, on the middle topic. We'll talk about naturalism in science, naturalism in culture, and finally we'll, we'll talk a bit about what naturalism misses, okay? Now you may also be thinking like, are you one of those uh, smart aleck professors who, who sprinkles in silly pop culture references to get me to pay attention? Um, that is possible. Uh, I will at least, I'll make some reference to at least all of these at some point as we, as we go throughout the evening, so... Um, and I appreciate all the people who are, who are watching uh, remotely as well. So, All right, let's go ahead and get going. The first thing I'll talk about, and I'll go through this briefly, is naturalism and science. So first, let's define this term naturalism. Have you all heard this word before? We don't usually use it in, day in, day out. If you were there at the, at the um, film on Friday, you no doubt heard Dr., Dr. Paul Nelson talk about this. Naturalism is basically the view that there's matter and energy, and that's about it, right? If it's not made of atoms floating around, that's, then it doesn't exist. That's, that's all that exists. Um, in Christian circles, there's sometimes a tendency to, to equate naturalism with, with atheism, and uh, it's not necessarily the same as we'll, as we'll find out. I think all naturalists are atheists, but uh, some atheists are actually feel a little bit uncomfortable with naturalism, as you, you'll find out. And so naturalism would be the belief that matter and energy are all that exist. And when I look around the room, when I, when I, when I think about what is a human being, uh, what is the universe made of, it's like... It's Basically, atoms and some subatomic particles, things like that, floating around. That's, that's all there is to it. That's naturalism. And <clears throat> the main way this enters the culture and affects someone like me in my daily job is, is in this way. Um, we, you'll frequently hear people talk about uh, methodological naturalism. I think Dr. Nelson may have mentioned this to you the other night. Methodological naturalism, if someone says that, that they're practicing this, they're trying to reassure you. They're, they're, they're saying, I'm not saying that nothing exists other than, than, than matter and energy. I'm just saying for the purposes of my scientific experiment today, I'm going to assume that there's nothing there except matter and energy and physical laws, and that's, that's all there is. I'm going to assume there's nothing outside of that system. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just going to assume it in order to, 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 to carry out this experiment and analyze my results. And that sounds very reasonable, right? I've got to do that in order to do good science and, and make sure. And, and so you may say, well, do you really have to do that? Why, why would someone do that? And the, the, true, the, the reason someone might do this is because experiments uh, go wrong sometimes, um, and you get data that doesn't make any sense, and you, you, you have experiments go very wrong, as in this case. And so uh, you sometimes have to say, what explanations am I going to give for the data? So this actually happened to me today. Today, a, a PhD student in my group came to me and basically said, like, uh, I think the computer is lying to me. You know, those, one of those kind of things. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Blah, blah, blah. So, so this, this temptation to say, like, well, what's going on here? Is there something outside of my system that's influencing my results? We say, no, whatever is there is there. And we don't want to allow for any outside influences on the results of the experiments. Just because you get a bad experimental data point doesn't mean you can just say, well, I'm going to throw that one out because a gremlin, you know, crept into my experiment and messed with that one, which, t trust me, as a scientist, it's tempting to sometimes blame bad experimental results on the gremlin. You say, I don't understand what happened here. So scientists say, for purposes of our experiment, we're going to assume that no gremlins get involved and that God doesn't do a miracle and mess up my experiment, something along those lines. But don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. We're not actually saying any anything about whether the supernatural actually exists or not. We're just restricting it for our own purposes here. Um, the difficulty comes, and this is what Dr. Nelson talked about last week, is when you look at a particular scientific situation and you start saying, mm, what if naturalistic explanations can't really uh, account for what I see in front of me? And this is what you spent the majority of your time last week. If you were here for the Origin of Life talk, I'm not going to recount the whole talk. I know, I know it was... It was uh, really thorough, and Dr. Nelson is actually one of the best people in the country to talk about this topic. So when you look at the origin of life, a lot, a lot of what you see is naturalistic processes, as far as we can tell, don't really do a great job of explaining where life could have originated. Okay? And the more we learn about the topic, the more of a problem it seems to be. I hope that was kind of the impression you got from hearing Dr. Nelson. Um, and so you may think, all right, if scientists assume naturalism, 
for all of their, their undertakings, then how would they, res they would respond to the, these findings? How would they respond to Dr. Nelson? Um, I'll, t I'll tell you the, the sad truth. Um, if you go to the uh, Harvard Museum of Natural Sciences, um, I've been there many times, um, I remember a few years ago they had an exhibit on the origin of life. And if you walked into that museum and went through the exhibit and said, uh, what are you going to tell me here about the origin of life? Oh, look. Oh, look at this display. Look at that. Look at that. They must have it all figured out. Well, that's good. And then you walk out, and then if you actually dig into the details, it turns out basically everything that they put up in their display was speculative. They said, uh -huh. maybe it was this, maybe it was this. Something like this must have happened. You think, how can they put that in the museum if they don't really know that that is true? How can they put that up in the museum if, if it's not really proven? And, and the logic is pretty clear. The, the person at the museum says, well, we know life began because here we are. And uh, if I'm trying to be a good scientist, I'm going to practice methodological naturalism, and I only allow naturalistic explanations. So, therefore, there is some explanation for how life originated, and it's naturalistic. And I don't know what it is, but I can put up some displays speculating on what that might be, and that's okay. Right? That's what they've done. Now, notice, in this whole chain of logic, no data actually, actually ever entered into, into their thinking. Right? This is very problematic, especially when you think about the fact that Maybe they're wrong. Maybe some, uh, some intelligent uh, uh, source actually is responsible for the origin of life. But if you follow according to these rules, that correct explanation has been defined as unacceptable. So the rules that have been set up actually make it where they can't find the right answer. So you can see what a problem this is. And so if you were go to, to go to Harvard and, and present this and hassle them and say, why did why'd you put up this, this speculative display about the origin of life when the reality is you don't really know Here's what they would probably respond. They would say, hey, 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 give me, give me a break. Give me a break. Give us more time. Science is always advancing, so there's a certain amount of data that we have. And we, you know, science is getting better and better and better. And we, we, uh, the, 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 the dark blue data here, that would be the data we can't really explain yet, but we're working on it. But look at all the other things we can't explain. And this, this uh, light blue part of the graph is always getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So eventually, if you give us enough time, we'll have it all figured out. I know our display here on the origin of life was kind of speculative, but we'll get there eventually. Okay? That's what they would tell you. We'll return again toward the end of the talk to evaluate whether this is the case. But I do want to press pause at this point, because now we're getting into the science. Um, I'm actually going to take a little bit of a, of, a, of a turn for the moment and talk about that particular attitude and how it affects not just scientists, but culture. Okay? Um, some of you, if you... If you you know, if you're here, if you're here tonight, if you're here on Friday, then you want to be here and you think this is important. However, you may have a little voice in the back of your mind or even a fellow church member who says things like this. They say, wait, wait, before we go down the rabbit hole talking about the origin of life and science and, and ribosomes and proteins and stuff like that, normal people don't talk about the origin of life. They don't even think about it. Like, when does that come up in conversation? So how does this topic of naturalism actually affect the way that I live my daily life and the way that I interact with other people? I mean, you can't just shoehorn it into the conversation. I mean, can you imagine being on an airplane and you turn to the person next to you? When's the last time you talked about ri or thought about ribosomes? Where do ribosomes come from? How could they evolve? Hmm? Like the person would look very deep in their book and not talk to you, right? So it's, it's hard to bring these, stuff, th these things up with your friend or over a casual lunch or at the water cooler. So it seems like a lot of this discussion of the origin of life and apologetics in general, it seems like something you can't talk to normal everyday people about. You have to admit that, right? Like, and some of you may be thinking, I wish I could talk to my friends about it, but it never seems to come up. How often does ri do ribosomes come up? Um, and so the bulk of the talk I'm going to talk about today is how naturalism is not something that's relegated over here uh, to the sciences. It's actually made its way into virtually every facet of our culture and, and will affect the, the, t the conversations you have with your friends across the board every day. So that's what I'm gonna, going to spend the bulk of my time on. Part of that is because you got a heavy dose of science on Friday, and then the next two speakers, who are real giants in, in, in this area, Walter Bradley and James Tour, are going to go deep in the science with you. So I'm going to take a step back and look a little more at how this affects the broader culture. And my hope is that, that this will help you actually analyze and understand where our culture is coming from when they say different kinds of things uh, about what they believe. Okay? So let's talk about our culture and the, the dominant cultural worldview. Note takers, again, God bless you. Um, if you're taking notes, there, there are three components to our, our, our dominant cultural worldview. And when I say dominant cultural worldview, I mean in, in the, the centers of influence. That can be government, that can be media, it's certainly academia. 
um, urban centers, things like that. And this is becoming more and more prevalent as time goes on. It has three components. Scientism, I'll define what that is. Individual autonomy, I'll define what that is. And then finally, the, the, the belief that religious, all religious beliefs are merely therapeutic. So I'll go through these one at a time. Okay, so we already said that um, our culture, we, the, when the scientists go out and try to do science, they say, I'm going to assume naturalism. I'm going to assume that naturalism is true insofar as my experiment is concerned. Right? That's methodological naturalism. But then what can happen is we go one step farther and they say, well, how do I really know anything? We can't get anybody to agree on anything. Ah, wait, there is something we can get everybody to agree on, more or less, right? And that's science. Science is objective. The principles of science are, are, are clear. Our cars work. The air conditioner work. Everybody agrees on the science. We may not be able to agree on anything else, but science we can agree on. And so science means you can objectively know something, and there's really no other sources by which you can objectively know something. That's what they would say. This belief is sometimes pejoratively called scientism. It's pejorative, but it deserves it. So I'll call it scientism. And let's talk a little bit more about where this belief comes from. It's actually fairly old, so let's make sure we get our definitions right. Scientism says uh, scientific testing, empirical, empirical testing, empirical data, that's the only reliable path to, uh, to objective knowledge. That's the only one. Everything else is speculation. Everything else we can't really agree on. And since science only deals with the natural world, that means the natural world is the only thing that you can actually know anything about objectively. Okay? People are very fond of saying this. They may say, I believe things based on evidence. I don't know about you, but I believe things based on evidence. When they say that, they are effectively espousing scientism. That science is the only reliable way to knowledge. Everything else is, is no good. Okay? So this gentleman here on the bottom right, uh, this is David Hume. He was a Scottish philosopher back in the 1700s, so this idea at least goes back that far, probably farther. He was famous for, for promoting this kind of concept. And it is, this concept is all over the place right now, certainly in academia. Some of you may have recently watched uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, uh, resurrection of the TV show Cosmos. And in the TV show Cosmos, they basically talk about scientism every five minutes, saying... Primitive people used to believe all kinds of things, but now we believe things based on evidence because we're superior, right? They basically say things like that over and over and over again, right? And uh, so I think I'm going to take away David Hume. I'm going to take away Neil deGrasse Tyson. I want you to really examine this definition of scientism, and I'll put it in um, a different form. I'll have this come from the, from the mouth of uh, the genie from Aladdin. So here's the genie. All right. I want you to look at what he says. He says, only beliefs that can be demonstrated through scientific experiments are trustworthy. Think about that sentence real hard. Only beliefs that can be demonstrated through scientific experiments are trustworthy. So Aladdin responds, can you demonstrate that statement through scientific experiments? And the genie would say, oh crud, I cannot. And actually, David Hume, David Hume more or less did this at one point. He said, oh wait, crud, that's a rule that fails itself. It's a standard that cannot meet its own standard because the standard itself is not scientific. It's a philosophy. And this belief in scientism not only undermines anything that's non-scientific, it undermines virtually all philosophies, including itself, which is a philosophy. So that's not very good. And so you may think, well, that's obviously silly. And truth be told, in, in the philosophical world, most people have abandoned scientism. It goes by other names among philosophers, positivism or empiricism. And so nobody really holds it to, to it anymore in, uh, from a strict sense. But still, it seems to linger, especially in popular culture. And you may, you may say, well, clearly it's self-refuting. So why does anyone believe this? Uh, the reason that people believe it is they think that we can't get anybody to agree. It's a really, it really stems from a discomfort with the fact that people can't agree on other things. They say, well, at least we can agree on science. And if you can't demonstrate your belief through scientific experiments, then you can't really expect other people to believe it. Right? So they say... Science is all we got. That's the only thing we can all agree on, so I guess that's what we're going to stick with. That's why people do it, even though it's self-refuting. This leads to the second point of our culture's worldview, which is individual autonomy. Autonomy is a fancy word for it. Every individual is a law unto themselves. Okay? Um, and what they say is science speaks only about the natural world. It doesn't tell you anything about what's right and wrong. It doesn't tell you anything about your purpose or your meaning in life. It can't tell you anything about any of those topics. Science doesn't speak to those topics. Right? You can't know about what you should do or what you ought to do. You can't get an ought from an is. You can't get an ought from scientific da data. Scientific data doesn't say anything about what we should or should not do. Okay? So since we can't get any of those things from science, the culture says, well, if we can't get it from science, then you can't know it. 
And so if you can't know where morality, right and wrong, where, where value and purpose and meaning come from, that means we all just got to make it up for ourselves. So every individual will then have the, the right to make up and determine their own identity, their own sense of meaning, and their own sense of what constitutes a good life. Does this sound familiar? All right, this is not something that just a handful of people who say. This is something that is all across the culture. In fact, uh, this has actually uh, been enshrined at some very high levels. So look at this quote. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. It's basically saying science can't define it for you, so you get to make it up for yourself. Um, does anyone recognize the origin of this quote? This is from the Supreme Court in the, a, a, a abortion case, actually, from the early 90s. Uh, uh, Justice Kennedy quoted this in Planned Parenthood v. Casey. So this is a famous quote for kind of enshrining this concept of individual autonomy. And then more recently, <clears throat> look at this. The Constitution promises liberty to all within its reach, a liberty that includes certain specific rights that allow persons within a lawful realm to define and express their identity. The right to personal choice regarding marriage is inherent in the concept of individual autonomy. This is from the uh, same-sex marriage ruling just a couple of years ago. So this is not something theoretical. This is like the reasoning that the Supreme Court is largely going on for these major culture-defining cases, okay? So let's walk through the logic of why someone would say this, and we'll see if we see a problem. So here's the logic. They say, science can't define should statements. That is fairly true, right? Uh, then they, they, number two is scientism, which is, it says science is the only way we can objectively know anything. Therefore, number three, no one objectively knows how we should live. Nobody knows. You can't tell other people how they should live because that would be arrogant. That would be presuming to know, and you don't because you can't get it from science. Then they say, therefore, everyone has the right to determine should statements for themselves. And if everyone has that right, then you should not tell others to conform to your sense of right and wrong. Now, where's the problem? There is a problem. We just got finished saying you can't you can't tell other people what they should or should not do, and you ended by telling people, other people what they should or should not do. So this individual autonomy is also self-refuting. It's like sitting on a branch and then cutting off the branch that you're sitting on. So individual autonomy is self-refuting. It's very much saying you should not tell other people should statements. Oh, crud, I just did, right? By the way, I think when I was growing up in church, people would sometimes use concepts like moral relativism, to define that, and they never really explained like, why people would hold to moral, rel moral relativism, but this at least shows the logic of where they're coming from. They're saying, if it doesn't come from science, you don't really know it, therefore we don't know where any right-wrong type statements come from, and then they conclude, okay, fine, everybody make it up for, for yourselves. Um, and at this point, someone who's a naturalist may say, well, look, if nobody knows where right and wrong come from, and science can't uh, adjudicate those differences, then what choice do we have other than to leave it up to individuals to decide for themselves? That's the only practical choice we have, right? Um, and the truth is, you might say that if you live in the United States. That's a very American concept. You may have smuggled some American constitution concepts, which are not necessarily naturalistic in with you. But uh, people in China say something very different. The government of China is, is very prone to say, science doesn't tell us what's right and wrong, Therefore, the way we should do things is we should do what's best for society, even if it means trampling on individual rights. And how can you possibly say that China's way of doing things is wrong and the United States' way of doing things is right? There's actually no way to tell between the two. So as soon as you start saying anything about rights, about people having the individual right, um, uh, uh, then you're going to run into some kind of standard that you can't judge, that you can't say this one's better than that one. Uh, Tim Keller phrases it this way, of course we must avoid harming others, but any decision about what harms others and what constitutes the good life would be rooted in generally unacknowledged views of human nature and purpose. The concept that we all have individual rights is obvious to an American, but if, if there are no such things as objective moral rights that we can actually say this is real and I really do know it and it really does apply to you, without, without those concepts, there's no way to, 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 there's no place to get those rights. There's no way to say that the way the United States does it is right and the way China does it is wrong. Okay, this leads to our third point of the, of the, um, the modern cultural worldview. This is that, that um, and I know you've heard this one before, the culture regards religious belief as no more than therapeutic. Does that word therapeutic mean something to you? It means whatever's good for you, whatever makes you feel good, whatever makes you feel comfortable. So what they would say is, um, 
If it's not science, we can't know it. Religious statements are not science, so therefore we can't really know them. They're just statements of opinion or speculation. And ultimately, they're just you know, man-made efforts to create meaning and create purpose. Um, and so they would tell you, um, that's fine. You can be religious. Go ahead. Be my guest. Believe whatever you want to believe. But don't try to tell other people that your religious views are correct and theirs are wrong because you don't actually know because you can't prove it from science. Okay? Have, have, by the way, do we agree that the culture says this with a megaphone every single day? Right? So they would say any objective religious claims are oppressive. Um, in fact, some of you all may have heard the concept of postmodernism. Postmodernism figures very heavily here where they would say any objective truth claim in the religious or moral realm is ultimately a power play. It's you trying to assert power over someone else or have influence over someone else, and it's, it's not actually a statement of, uh, of fact. Um, this relates to our, co- our culture's common... Uh, by the way, you, you also may have heard people in our culture say things like, all religions are basically the same. You all hear people say this? Let's analyze that a little bit, because on its face it seems ridiculous. Clearly all religions are not the same because they say opposite things. So if all religions can't equally be true... So are they all false? Is that what someone's trying to say? Here's what they're really trying to say. And people will frequently use this. um, Have you all heard this elephant illustration before? People will use this illustration. And they try to sound very magnanimous. They say, look, look, look. All religions are, um, they're they're just looking at maybe a piece of truth. It's all kind of man-made attempts to understand the truth about what's ultimate, about what's God. So it's like a bunch of blind people looking at an elephant, right? And, or they, they can't look, they're blind, so they're trying to feel for the elephant. And one blind person may have the elephant's trunk, and they say, well, this thing must be kind of like a snake. And someone else says, no, it's more like a wall because they're feeling the elephant's side. And someone else feels, you know, the elephant's ear and says, no, it's like a giant leaf. And so all these different religions are just grasping at different parts of the truth, but they're just man-made attempts to try to figure out what's really real, but no one really has um, uh, uh, the market cornered on what truth is. So don't be arrogant. Don't try to say that you know what's true and everybody else doesn't because you're just as blind as everyone else, right? You're all just these. So really what people are saying when they say all religions are the same, they are saying that all religions are man-made. That's the sense in which all religions are true, according to them. All of us are just like blind people grasping and trying to, to get our little piece of the truth. But, if, but really, we shouldn't be arrogant. We shouldn't tell other people that they're wrong because we're all blind and we're all just getting little bits of this. This is effectively what the culture says, right? Again, there's, there's, a, there's a real problem here. There's a self-refuting difficulty here. If you say all the world's religions are like this, you're effectively saying that you're not blind. You're effectively saying, oh, I see what it really is. It really is an elephant and all of you are wrong. But the whole goal of the illustration was to undercut arrogance and prevent people from telling other people that they're wrong. But if you use the illustration at all, you are being arrogant and you are telling other people that they're wrong. So this, this illustration really, really harms itself. This illustration also brings up the, the rather obvious point that you say, well, how could, they, how could someone figure out that, this, that it's an elephant without trying to make it sound like they're arrogant and not blind? Um, there is one possibility, and that's the elephant could uh, reveal itself and say, I'm an elephant, right? It could say that. The elephant could reveal to one of the blind men, I'm an elephant, and the other blind man could say, guys, I got it. I got it. It's an elephant. And everyone else says, you don't be arrogant and tell us that, they're wrong, that we're wrong. You're just as blind as we are. And the, the blind man could say, yeah, but I have revelation. I have some outside source other than just my own little graspings so that my, what I'm telling you is just not my own man-made speculation, but it's actually information from an outside source, right? So don't let people get away with this elephant illustration. It's all over the place, and it, it completely undercuts itself. Um, and and uh, I want to I contrast this with the way that the Bible actually talks about how, how people uh, know, that, know that God exists. If you go to Athens, you can see the, this is the Acropolis, and then the, uh, the Parthenon's kind of back here up on the top. And the Bible actually describes this exact spot. It says that Paul went to Athens and talked with a bunch of Athenian philosophers who would fit right in in modern-day academia for the most part. They speculate every day and are never really sure what's true and what's not. And here's what Paul tells them. He, tell, he, he sat right on that spot. I took this picture years ago. This is, this is called the Areopagus, which translates into Mars Hill. You all heard of this now? Yeah. So Paul stands right on top and he says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. So all those Greek temples and statues, those are man-made, right? That's man-made speculation, searching after God and speculating about what God might be. Paul says, what I'm telling you is not like that. 
God does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So this is not a case of man-made speculation about what God is like. This is God revealing himself. This is not a God who we made up. He's a God who really is there. Very different than what those Greeks were used to. Okay, so one of the things you can do with this information I've given you is you can kind of analyze what people really mean when they make different kinds of statements. Um, I originally had a bunch of these. I cut it out for the sake of time. But um, you may hear some, someone say a, a sentence like this. They'll say, um, I don't see how Jesus is relevant to me. Now, you may be tempted in the moment to say, like, that's stupid. If Jesus really is who he says he is and he died and rose from the grave, then that's very relevant to you. That's your temptation is to immediately say, that's dumb. Here's why. Ba, ba, ba. But I would encourage you, don't immediately jump to that. Don't immediately jump to that. What you, what you should do when you hear something like this is help that person to try to think through why they said it. It's a very weird truth test, right? If they say, I don't see how Jesus is relevant to me, effectively they're saying their test for truth is if something feels emotionally or therapeutically relevant, right? They remember they're assuming that re- religion is merely therapeutic and they're just going to believe whatever feels right to them or whatever works for them because they can't ultimately know what's true. Um, Tim Keller actually writes, he says, hidden beneath this feeling is the very modern American belief that the existence of God is a matter of indifference unless it intersects with my emotional needs. So if you really want to throw your friend for a loop, you can say, that's a very 21st century American thing to say, which it is, right? That should make them say, what do you mean? It is a very 21st century American thing to say. And they should feel like, oh, wait, maybe I'm soaking up the culture around me and I haven't really thought through my own truth tests and my own reasoning for believing why I believe. And lots of the statements that you hear from across the culture have the same kind of feel, right? If you hear people say things like, well, religion is based on faith and science is based on evidence, and instead of immediately arguing with them, try to get at that worldview and see what's underlying it. You can see that ultimately scientism is under there somewhere. Some assumption that the only thing we can objectively know is what comes from science. Other kinds of things people might say would include things like, uh, let me get to it here. People might say things uh, along the lines of, uh, well, Christianity seems unscientific and old-fashioned. Have you ever heard people say things like that? Again, it's this assumption like, Whatever comes from science, that's what I know from truth, or that, that, that's, that's, what I know, that's what I know to be true. If something is older and old-fashioned, that means it's in the past, it's primitive, it's not up-to-date, therefore it must be wrong. Uh, all these things come from this underlying assumption of scientism, and, and it makes them doubt anything that doesn't come from science, even though all those concepts are self-refuting. Okay, so I guess one thing I would, I would recommend for you, each of you for the future... Um, is ask leading questions to determine what the root of their belief is. So the arguments on Facebook are usually up here in the branches, like if someone wants to argue about, with you about whatever social you know, argument of, of the day. But then the worldview issues are usually down here. So don't stay up here. Ask them what's underneath their statements. Okay? So I'll summarize this, this overall second point, is that behind our culture's worldview are several different beliefs, and they're all self-defeating. One was scientism. That's the idea that We can only know things through science, even though that statement cannot itself be known by science, so therefore it's self-defeating. They believe in the right to individual autonomy in regard to anything that doesn't relate to science, like morality, purpose, meaning, etc. But that concept is also self-defeating because you can't assume a right to something without assuming that there is some morally real concept that you actually do know. And finally, this last one, uh, people like to say, oh, religious claims, that's just people trying to make themselves feel better or find meaning. Those religious truth claims aren't actually a, in any real objective truth uh, about the way the universe is. But that statement itself is arrogant. It is a statement about religious truth. And so, again, it fails its own test. Okay. So and all of these kind of fall into that category where you're sitting on the branch and you saw the log off and, 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 it, and it falls off with you. I'll end on this. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what naturalism misses. And um, I, I, there's a lot that could be said here about um, why I'm not a naturalist and, and where naturalism tends to go awry. Uh, but one thing I do want to pick back up is this little picture. Um, one thing Dr. Nelson may have mentioned to you last week is that peop- the scientists like to look at this little picture and they say, ah, this is a gap in our knowledge. And you Christians, when you talk about the origin of life being a problem, all you're doing is committing the God of the gaps fallacy. Have you all heard of this? It's the idea that whenever, you Christians, whenever, whenever there's a gap in our knowledge, you're just trying to stick God into the gap. But the gap is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as science advances, and eventually there will be nothing left for God to do. That's their argument. That's what they would say. Okay? Um, they also don't like putting God in the gap, so to, see, so to speak, because it may imply that we can 
and be satisfied with partial explanations and not continue doing science. Richard Dawkins himself says, I'm against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. He's saying it's a science stopper. We're going to stop investigating because you're trying to put science in there. And uh, what are we to make of this assessment? First thing we need to do is we do have to admit that Christians on occasion have done stuff like this, and we, uh, we continue to do so. Um, one of the worst examples I've ever seen, uh, I, can, I can list here. Who, who's this gentleman? Bill O'Reilly. Now, Bill O'Reilly has his pluses and minuses, but on this particular day, he was not batting a 1,000. Um, he had an atheist on, and uh, Bill O'Reilly was trying to argue with this atheist, and uh, the example he chose of, like, here's some scientific phenomenon that you can't possibly explain, and therefore God is responsible for it. The example he chose is he said, every day the tides go in, the tides go out. Tide go in, tide go out. You can't explain that. And, of course, you know, the 8-year-old children are at home like, I think we know that. <laughs> it has to do with the moon's gravitational pull. On the, you know that, right? And then the atheist didn't know it either. And the atheist was like, I'm sure there's... Blah, blah, blah. Never mind that. And so then the two of them continued arguing about the tides. And all the eight-year-olds are at home like smashing their faces against the TV like, how do you not know this? I mean, oh, anyway. So anyway, that little incident um, prompted a number of, of, of memes along, along these lines. Uh, bread goes in, toast comes out. You can't explain that. So you have to admit, Christians are on occasion... Guilty of stuff like this where we're saying, ah, you can't explain that, therefore it's God. So we do need to be a little careful, okay? But I want to give, so, so I want to give kind of an alternate take on this whole God of the gaps thing. Um, one thing we can say on the origin of life topic, hopefully one thing you learned on Friday is like the more we learn about the origin of life, that particular gap seems to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So, so the idea that the gap is getting smaller doesn't always necessarily bear out. The other thing is, there's a whole cluster of other topics. There's a whole cluster of other topics beyond just what the scientific data says that we need to be able to explain. I wish I could go through every single one of these. Ultimately, every one of these constitutes some kind of argument for the supernatural and some argument against naturalism. We could talk about things like beauty. Um, I mentioned already a little bit moral norms and human rights. Um, the cosmological argument has to do with the origin of the universe. We could talk about the applicability of math to the universe and, and, and where physical laws come from and the fact that we can actually use our minds to understand the universe. But I'm going to largely focus on these last two. And some of these things, you, you notice, this is, this is not exactly scientific data. It's not stuff that science is going to get more data or, or more explanation and be able to go attack. Um, the one I'm going to focus on the most has to do with our mind, which relates to these last two, cognitive reliability and subjective consciousness. So that's what I'll end on. And this is a personal issue for me. I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you all. My very first year of grad school, I had a small period of doubt where I was like, oh, man. I, basically what happened is I thought, if the, if the naturalists are right, then when, uh, when I die, I'll cease to exist. And eventually the entire universe is going to go to heat death, and everything I love and treasure is going to come to nothing. What an awful conclusion. <gasps> oh, crud, I must believe in all this Christianity stuff because I don't want that to be true. So I had a period of time where I was really skeptical and thought I was kind of second-guessing myself, like, do I just believe things because I want it to be true? And then I eventually came out of that. Several things brought me out of that. I started reading a lot of Lord of the Rings. That really helped. That, that helped. No, I'm, I'm not, I am not joking. I am not joking. Uh, I basically said, like, the universe is, would be a lot more boring and a lot less like a creative, high-stakes story if, if naturalism were true. Right? The universe seems to resemble a, a Tolkien-esque story much more than it does the drab, gray boringness that you'd expect if there was no mind behind it. I know that's not satisfying to all the naturalists of the world, but it made a big difference to me. Um, the other thing I realized is this whole skeptical attitude of like, you only believe this because you want to. Like, that attitude is a universal acid. It, it eats through everything, and it doesn't matter what you believe. Someone can say, you only believe this because blah. It's actually very lazy because it just assumes that the belief is wrong and then speculates on why the, belief, the false belief may have come along. It takes no work. It takes no effort. Any fool can be a skeptic. It's not actually an argument, right? And here is the third thing that brought me out of my little skeptical time. It was thinking about the human mind itself. Okay, and that's what I want to walk you through. And in case you have one of those dark nights of the souls where you, where you, where you say, oh, crud, how do I know this stuff is, all, is, is okay? How do I know that, that the naturalists aren't right? This is always the one that I come back to and I say, oh, never mind. Oh, it's fine. Okay, so let's think about our mind, and let's think about our mind as it relates to science. If you want to be a scientist, you have to make certain assumptions to even get going. You have to assume, 
uh, that sense perception is reliable, that's, that's okay. I can, my eyes, you know, like I see that light, I see the colors, you know, I, my sense perception for the most part is reliable. That's all right. Um, I, have to un- I have to assume that the universe itself is understandable and orderly, follows certain mathematical regularities. I have to assume that. I don't go discover that. I have to assume it to even get going. And I have to assume that my mind is reliable. So the question is, why do I get to make those assumptions? You have to assume it to even start doing science. Let's examine those assumptions if naturalism is true. If naturalism is true, then I start having problems. Uh, because it turns out if naturalism is true and there's only atoms and energy and things like that and there's nothing else, then I don't really have a mind. I have a brain. I have a brain that goes through biochemical reactions. That's about it. One other thing I have is all the time I have a subjective first-person conscious experience. And you say, what does that mean? That means that like right now, you know, uh, right now I'm over here and you can see me kind of from behind your eyes and you have your own internal thought life, your own mental processes, and your own kind of rational sense of reasoning through things and your own, your, your own private access to what you think and no one else has access to that. Does that make sense? That's your subjective consciousness. I actually don't have access to that. I can't verify that you have it, but I, I believe that you do. Okay? So that's that subjective, subjective conscious experience that you have, if naturalism is true, is also just biochemistry and nothing more. Right? And finally, this last one, um, is my sense of rational, logical thought that I try to think things through and actually decide what I believe, is that legitimate? Is it really rational or is it just biochemistry? On naturalism, it's just biochemistry. Um, all three of these are really problematic. If you say like, eh, I don't really have a mind, eh, I don't really have a subjective first-person conscious self, this one, if you deny that one, you basically believe that you are not a you, you are not a self, you're just a collection of atoms, and that's it. And you may think, no one believes that. Nobody believes that. Nobody, oh my gosh, look at this. This is Time Magazine. Look at the headline. You exist, right? Prove it. How 100 billion jabbering neurons create the knowledge or illusion that you're here. And, and, and I, there, there are naturalists out there who will actually legitimately say, legitimately say the subjective conscious self is an illusion. It's not real. And, I mean, the only response is, like, I know more surely than I know anything that I am a subjective conscious self because I experience it immediately, right? You can see where this kind of stuff is going. Uh, has anyone heard of this name before? Francis Crick of Crick and Watson fame. Uh, he is uh, credited for the discovery, discovery of the double helix structure of DNA, may have stolen some credit from a young lady around the time, around that time, that's okay. Uh, and here's what, Crick is an atheist, and he's a naturalist, and he says about the mind, he says, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. That's all you are. Now, we should be hard on Crick and say, hey man, that's true of you too, homie, right? Let's change, let's, <laughs> Let's change, your, let's change your slide a little bit. Okay, now let's try it again. My joys and my sorrows, my memories, my ambitions, my sense of personal identity and free will are, in fact, no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. In fact, I'm not rational at all, and I don't know why anyone's listening to me, right? <laughs> when you start, this, is, this is what brought me out. I started saying, like, wait, if I'm just biochemistry, then why am I listening to myself, right? Because I'm no longer a logical, reasoning, conscious self. I'm a biochemical reaction, and that's it. So the word to describe all this is called reductionism. You are reduced to just the atoms, just the biochemistry, and that's it. And if you wonder, like, do naturalists legitimately worry about this? Does this bother them? It does. Look at this quote. With me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which have been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? That quote comes from Darwin himself. So this little worry of like, oh wait, have I just undermined cognitive reliability of human minds? This worry goes back a long way. And my point tonight is not to haggle over all the ins and outs and particulars of evolution. My point is more so to show that this worry that naturalism undermines human cognitive reliability goes all the way back to Darwin. It is a real worry. And if I were a naturalist, this is what would keep me up at night. Okay? So then, uh, so naturalists would say, well, maybe, 
maybe our, uh, our brains evolved to like, help us figure out true information. So therefore, even though it's just a brain, it can still kind of figure things out and get answers correct most of the time. It still doesn't really work because that basically means your brain has evolved to be really good at like, surviving and reproducing, and running away from danger and things like that. But in terms of figuring out metaphysical truth and log- logical truth, like, that's kind of up for grabs. Right? There's no guarantee that your brain can actually determine truth if it's just an accidental biochemical soup, right? And so this is the point where some naturalists say, well, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Um, maybe we don't have to be reductionist. Maybe, even though we're made of atoms and, and that's it, and we're just biochemistry, maybe consciousness and rational thought is some emergent property it's an emergent property that supervenes on a neural network once you get all the places in place. Have you ever heard people say this? This would be a non-reductionistic approach. They say, I'm not going to just reduce everything down to atoms. I say, once the atoms are in place, there are other things. There's this consciousness that supervenes on this neural network of bio- biochemical uh, interactions. Um, the natural question is, what do you mean emerges? What do you mean supervenes? That doesn't sound very scientific. And the answer is, they don't know. They may as well say it's magic. I don't think any of them know what they, what they mean when they say this. And the fact that they say stuff like this shows that, that they're, they're nervous about it. Um, this also shows that, it, that this, this whole concept that, oh, gosh, this is a real problem, it shows up all over the place. So this was in the New York Times recently. And uh, if you come from a religious background, this uh, columnist from the New York Times uh, is talking about you. He says, religion has the hallmarks of an evolved behavior, meaning that it exists because it was favored by natural selection. It was wired into our neural circuitry before the ancestral human population dispersed from its African homeland. So you don't believe in religion because of any rational reason. You believe that because it's wired into you by evolution. You've got to, be, you, you've got to turn it back on them and say, <clears throat> there's a problem here. It has to, you have to turn it back on him, and it's where he, he has to say, everything I believe, including this statement, is also not rational and is merely evolved. And so you see what I'm saying? Like you, Any kind of statement where they say, you only believe something because of some biochemical factor, they have to be willing to turn that knife back on themselves and say, oh, crud, this cuts both ways. I can't honestly, consistently believe this. Okay? So ultimately, the consequences of naturalism, I talked earlier about how it undercuts right and wrong, good and evil. All should statements go out the door. Uh, meaning and purpose go out the door, and ultimately, it really hits things that we can't honestly deny. We, you can't deny cognitive reliability, because if you can deny cognitive reliability, that means you shouldn't listen to yourself. If you deny first-person subjective experience, then I don't know what you're doing, because you're having a subjective first-person experience right now. And ultimately, I believe that believing in naturalism undercuts science itself, because, oh, by the way, all these kind of problems... Um, I mentioned earlier that not all atheists are naturalists. If you keep on with these kind of arguments, there are a lot of atheists out there who are like, don't, don't put that, push that naturalist stuff on me. I'm not, I'm not a naturalist. And you say, then what do you believe in? Um, and some of them may be- believe in platonic ideals or something like that anyway. But the fact that, that a lot of atheists are uncomfortable with naturalism tells you that there's a real problem. Um, and I've, I've, that, that said, most of the time, atheism and naturalism do kind of get lumped in together, Right? The atheists say there's no God, there's just atoms and molecules and that sort of thing. So if you, if you do lump them together and you say, okay, Mr. Atheist, Mr. Naturalist, what kind of assumptions do I need to make in order to be a scientist? They, can, they would be able to convince you, I think. Well, since perception has to be reliable, it would have to ev- evolve correctly in order for things to survive and reproduce. Um, the universe is understandable and orderly. That's very difficult to prove on naturalism. Why should that be so? If you're interested, by the way, there's a very famous essay, not written by a theist at all, but it's, the essay is called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. Mathematical truths have to be true, but the fact that the physical world follows these mathematical regularities such that we can do science, why should that be so? From a naturalist perspective, it's very difficult to say why that should be the case. Furthermore, under naturalism, you end up crossing out whether your mind is reliable. But now let's, let's turn it around. I'm, I'm a Christian, and I look at the same set of, of, of assumptions from a Christian perspective. I believe sense perception is reliable, and I believe the universe is understandable and orderly because God made it to be understandable and orderly. In fact, God wanted me and you to be able to look at the universe and understand it. And the same God who made the universe and the stars and the planets and the atoms 
and the hydrogen bonding and everything else, that same God who made all that stuff also made our minds and made our minds such that our minds would be able to grasp those concepts. So that is consistent, right? That set of assumptions, this set of assumptions that I need to make in order to do science fits very nicely within a Christian worldview. And in fact, that is the reason that so many of the pioneers in science were Christian. If you don't believe me, there are all these beautiful quotes back from the 1500s and 1600s. Uh, the best all come from Johannes Kepler. He always has a beautiful way of phrasing things. He says, these scientific laws are within the grasp of the human mind. God wanted us to recognize them by creating us after his own image so that we could share in his own thoughts. And so for the, some of you who are considering studying science, let's say you go do research in, in, uh, let's say you do research in, uh, in uh, chemistry. And let's say you go to, I don't know, Texas A&M, and you go work at the cyclotron, which is the building right next to mine. And at the cyclotron, you figure out something about these little inner particle dynamics, and you figure out something that no one has ever known before. You say, wow, I'm the first one to know this since God made it and put it there, and God wanted me to figure out. And it's almost like looking at someone else's little, like someone else to put together a Lego set, and you look at it and say, oh, I see how you put that together. Good job. That's effectively what you're doing when you do science. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you one more Kepler quote because they're so good. Uh, Kepler says, uh, The diversity of the phenomena of nature is so great and the treasures hidden in the heavens so rich precisely in order that the human mind shall never be lacking in fresh nourishment. Basically, Kepler is saying, like, you don't get to be bored. Bored is not an option. God made a beautiful, amazing world for you to go figure out so that you would never be, uh, never be bored. You would always be saying, wow. And a steady diet of wow is why it's great to be a scientist. And that's why we should all go major in chemical engineering. No, anyway. Um, uh, with that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to close and take questions, but I want to quickly tell you, please uh, feel free to email me. Um, also, uh, feel free to check out the Texas A&M Christian Faculty Network, um, and uh, if, if you're an Aggie especially, please, by all means, please support the Christian Faculty Network. We do a lot of great work on campus trying to minister to students who are often just showing up on campus and, like, kind of freaked out, and so having Christian faculty there to say, hey there, it's okay. You don't have to check your brain at the door. You can be a Christian and be a scientist at the same time. With that, I'll take any questions. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you so much, you Dr. Green. Uh, what a great presentation. And, yes, we are going to now transition to our question and answer time. Uh, let me tell you a little bit of how this is going to work, especially since we have uh, the remote location mm -hmm. in Katy. It actually has a room full of uh, almost the same size uh, as this room here and the same number of people, uh, mm -hmm. which is great. So a great, uh, great crowd this evening. Uh, I'm going to, in just a moment, I'll flip the screen to actually the uh, webcam that's in Katie as well. And we'll kind of, we'll go back and forth a little bit there on, on questions. When you do have a question, what I'm going to do, I'm going to set this mic <laughs> over here. I'm going to ask if you can come forward and just ask your question from here. I know it's a little bit awkward, but it works well, and it will also allow uh, the location in Katie to be able to hear you and, and understand what the question is also. Is that all clear to everybody? Okay. And then in Katie, uh, you can do the same thing, uh, and Jeff will direct you there to be where the webcam can see you and hear you. All right. So let me just flip the connection here. And That is not Katie. <laughs> oh, there he is. Okay. There's Katie. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Does anyone have a question that you'd like to ask? If so, would you mind coming up and following our procedure here? <laughs> From a uh, naturalist or scientist point of view, are you aware of any impact that dark energy and dark matter may have on their assessment of their ability to accurately understand reality? If, for example, they suggest that dark energy and dark matter are a major constituent of our universe, could they have any real confidence then in their beliefs about any system that they've assessed or try to understand that it's accurate to any degree if they haven't accounted for dark matter or dark energy? 
Sure. The, so the, the question was about dark matter and dark energy. Thank you. I appreciate the question. Um, if, you, if you're unfamiliar with this, with this term, have you all heard this phrase? It sounds very Star Trek-y, like, you know, what's going wrong this week? Oh, dark matter, Captain, you know. So anyway, um, so I, first of all, I'll qualify this statement. I'm not a physicist. I'm not a cosmologist. All I know is what I hear from podcasts and reading books, you know, right? So, uh, but my understanding, effectively, is that dark matter and dark energy are posited by cosmologists to explain things like the expansion rate of the universe and the gravitational effects on one thing versus another. And... Um, uh, actually, at Texas A&M, not too long ago, we had Dr. Luke Barnes, who is one of the, the, the world experts on the topic of the, the fine-tuning of the universe, and he talked briefly about this. What makes dark matter dark is you can't see it, but you can indirectly see its effects gravitationally, right? Um, so anyway, it's, it's posited to explain, like, why do we see the expansion rate that we do? Why do we see the cosmic background radiation that we do, that there are these things called dark matter and dark energy? We don't know where they originate. We can't net directly see them, but we can see their effects. Um, so the question is, like, does that undermine the rest of science? Does that undermine questions relating to chemistry? Does that undermine questions related to the origin of life? Um, the short answer is I don't know. Basically, if you're not a cosmologist, you never really talk about it. You never really talk about dark matter and dark energy. Um, I will say you'll meet more than one kind of scientist. There are some scientists who say, I don't even know if there are physical laws. All I do is curve fit data and use it to make predictions, but I don't know if there's any underlying physical laws. And believe it or not, even, even Stephen Hawking has said stuff like that. And I'm like, what? anyway, I don't, but your, your average scientist is a, is a realist who says, those physical laws describe what's freaking there. It really is there. It really, did, it, it really does follow those laws. I'm not just curve fitting. I really am uh, making predictions and making discoveries. And I tend toward that, that direction myself because the discoveries make predictions not only about what you're going to get in your next experiment, but what you're, disco go what you're going to discover decades down the road. There are a lot of, um, I guess, gravitational waves and things like that would be good examples of predictions made decades before they're act actually detected. Um, I will tell you, dark matter and dark energy, the way they intersect with apologetics is usually in regard to the, uh, the origin of the universe. So I didn't talk to you about that. Since you brought it up, I'll quickly say one of, the, one of the arguments against naturalism is where did the universe come from? It's three possibilities, right? Universe popped out of nothing. That doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> universe is past eternal. That also doesn't make any sense. Or something outside the universe that is timeless and transcendent and uncaused and necessary caused the universe. And you don't have to you start listing too many of those adjectives and the, the G word starts to come to your mind pretty quickly. And uh, anyway, your average naturalist gets real nervous when you start talking about the origin of the universe. And so there has been a lot of discussion among cosmologists of like, oh, maybe we can scramble and use dark energy or dark matter or something to account for the universe coming from nothing. In fact, there was a, uh, there was a headline on CNN.com not too long ago. Stephen Hawking said, we don't need to posit a God. Oh, I guess he didn't say it like that. But anyway, Stephen Hawking said, we don't need to posit a God. If you have a law of gravity, then the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Think about that statement. <laughs> Given the law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Wait a minute. You don't get a law of gravity. You have nothing. And so if you hear any physicist say things, in fact, there's a book from Lawrence Krauss, A Universe from Nothing. If you hear any physicist say stuff like that, universe from nothing. They're across the board trying to avoid the implication that some cause outside the universe caused the universe. And when they say nothing, they're always smuggling an actual something along with it. Every time, I guarantee you. So, you bet. Okay, we have a question from the uh, Katie location. Yes. Howdy. <laughs> Howdy. My name is Robert Stowe. And I have a question that uh, that I had the tech is with me in your presentation, but I didn't hear it specifically addressed. And that is the role of deductive reasoning in science. Yeah. So I mean, I think deductive deductive reasoning is 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 good, but it, we usually can't quite. You, you don't always get to use it. D deductive reasoning would be premise one, premise two, premise three, therefore a conclusion, right? And you can logically see whether, you know, the, pre the conclusion follows from the premises, and then you have to check if each premise is particularly true. That's deductive reasoning. Usually in science, you don't get to do that. You go out and you make observations, and you say, well, this is what I observed, this is what I observed, this is what I observed. And from that, I will do what's called inductive reasoning. From all this data I see, I'm going to inductively say, it looks like there is this pattern, there's this physical law that fits this data and this data and this data. 
right? That's inductive reasoning. And inductive reasoning is not foolproof the way deductive reasoning is. And the reason scientists do it, the reason scientists rely so much on inductive reasoning is because we assume that the universe is orderly and is not playing tricks on us, right? We say, here is, here is a physical law that describes electrostatic interactions. We cannot deductively get that law. All we can do is make measurements, look at the data, and figure out, here's this law. I assume it's going to work tomorrow. I assume it's going to work the same way on Mars that it does here, but I cannot deductively prove those things. I'm going to assume that those things work because I'm going to assume that the universe is orderly and understandable and intelligible and isn't playing tricks on me. And uh, those assumptions are hard to make from a natural standpoint, but as a Christian, those assumptions make pretty good sense. So, yeah. Thanks. Please stay a while. First question. Yeah. So, um, so a lot of your argument was basically for you to make these naturalistic claims, you're making a lot of self-refuting statements. Yes. And it all pretty much just falls apart. Right. Because they're all self-refuting. So I read something recently that said that kind of pushed on science. So, you know, science really can't answer hardly anything if you push it far enough. Yeah. So what is matter? What is energy? Right. What is light? All these things, they really don't have an answer. Right. And I thought, gosh, I, I never thought of that before. Do you think that's an effective approach to someone who's a naturalist, or would they just say, well, we're just not there yet? Yeah, I guess this is a good question. So f folks and Katie, I don't know if you could hear that, but the question was um, when you start pushing science and saying, asking very ultimate questions like what is matter, what is light, where did the universe come from, like science is going to run out of answers at some point. They're never going to be able to give you a, 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 a kind of tidy explanation and put a bow on it and say, now we're done as much as cosmologists would like to believe that we can. Um, the, the tactic I would take is this. Um, naturalists are very, like, you'll hear this all over the place. Naturalists will say, look how good science is. Look what a good job it does. Based on this excellent track record that science has, I'm going to trust in science alone because nobody else, nothing else is, is as objectively, and, uh, objectively orchestrated and universally agreed upon as science. And what you have to push them on is you have to say, science is good at what science is good at. But there are a lot of things that are outside the bounds of science, and it's no bueno to just say, well, if science can't address it, then I guess it doesn't exist. That flies in the face of too much of the rest of our experience. But by phrasing it that way, you don't, you don't want to insult science. You don't want to insult scientists. So I, I do think it is good to say science is good at what science is good at, but don't assume that if something doesn't fit into that particular uh, uh, pot, that it doesn't exist, which is what naturalists tend to do. Yeah. Okay, we have another question here, or in Katie? I know we do. Who, who is it? Yeah. Okay, if you don't mind coming up. So I'm, I was really hoping that you would talk more about the spiritual realm oh, a little yes. bit. <laughs> yeah. So we're, just talk about that. <laughs> about, about how the about how the how the spiritual aspect relates yeah, to all like, this, and and really, how do you talk to other scientists about the spiritual realm of our beliefs? Oh, this is a good question. Um, I, so the the question was how where where does the spiritual aspect relate to all this? And uh, this this question is a good one from multiple sources. Um, from one perspective, like you could spend your all, your all your time going into getting into apologetics and learning this stuff, and there's a certain temptation to be like, and now I know this, now I can prove you wrong. How? Like, like that's not that's not very helpful. That's not very godly, right? And so, so I be careful going down down that path. Just because you can know a lot and maybe do decent in a debate doesn't mean that's actually leading you anywhere closer to godliness, right? Um, and the the other kind of related point was, if you're talking to someone about these kind of points and you can you can you can make sense to them and maybe maybe um, undo some stereotypes or get them to question where they're coming from, what good is that to them spiritually? Can you help them to kind of turn the corner spiritually? I will tell you kind of where the rubber has met the road for me talking to my colleagues, and I think this will probably be true for many of you too. Your average educated American has bought into certain lies, and if you bring it up, they will kind of admit to you like, oh, yeah, and, and a good example would be in, in my own field of chemical engineering, it's very competitive. Everybody's constantly trying to get grants. They're trying to get papers, and people will kill themselves. They'll work themselves to death. They'll sacrifice their marriages. They'll sacrifice their relationship with their children. They'll sacrifice all these things just so that everybody else might have a slightly higher opinion of them. 
so that 50 people in the world will think they're a little bit smarter, right? And so I can talk to my colleagues along these lines and say, isn't it silly that we, we put so much of our identity into other people thinking that we're smart? Isn't it silly that we do that? And even a non-Christian, even someone who's completely non-religious, understands the concept of an idol. They say, yeah, you're right. We do, we do do that. We, we completely idolize the applause of other people. I originally wanted to be a scientist because I thought science was awesome, but now a lot, I see that a lot of my own effort is self-promotion and, wanting to, and being addicted to the applause of other people and other people telling me I'm smart. That conversation is, a, is, is an open door to the gospel. Tell them, your identity is not based on what you do. Your identity is not based on whether people think you're smart. Your identity is not based on you having all the answers. Your identity is based on what God thinks of you and the relationship that you have with God. Um, so that's usually where the conversation takes that, that turn. And I would encourage you to have that same sort of, of conversation with your coworkers. It's amazing the degree to which... Um, uh, everybody, regardless of their religious background, understands the concepts of the concept of idols and understands that they're empty. So uh, that's usually the, the way the, the conversation goes with, with most of my coworkers. So. Great. I think we have a question from Katie now. Since no one else is going to, my name is Jeff Craig. I got a question about uh, you mentioned your Christian faculty network. Yeah. I know A and M is a very conservative, or at least used to be a fairly conservative university, but how big is your faculty, you know, Christian faculty network, and do you have any kind of, not necessarily persecution, but what kind of pushback do you get from the secular members of the faculty up there? Uh, so this is a good question. The question is, what about the Christian faculty network at Texas A&M? I will tell you, I think the Christian faculty network at Texas A&M is more active and has more members than just about any other university in the country. Um, A&M does trend conservative compared to other universities. Uh, we probably have... Uh, about 250 on our mailing list, but it's not nearly, it's not probably that many that actually show up to all the different events. So we have certain, certain, you know, people who are more involved than others. One bizarre thing is that it varies enormously by discipline. Tons of people in the College of Business Administration are Christians. Quite a few in engineering. Nobody in sociology, right? <laughs> right? Not that many biologists either, and that should tell you something. It, it tends to mean that, like, in grad school, there are Christians either self-select out or do tend to get persecuted along the way. Right? So when you look at the distribution of faculty members in the Christian faculty network, that ought to tell you about how friendly these different sub-areas are for Christians as they go on their road to becoming a faculty member. It wasn't that bad for me in chemical engineering. If I were a biologist, I'd probably, a biologist would probably have a pretty tough time. Sociologists would probably have a pretty tough time. Um, anyway, uh, uh, compared to other universities, you all probably seen some of the headlines of some of the Insanity that has happened at other universities. Uh, uh, I, I think we don't face persecution too terribly badly. We haven't had any real incidents. We are always concerned about it, about whether, you know, all it takes is one student with a chip on their shoulder to really cause, cause a hubbub. Um, uh, I, I think I have to, I do have to commend our, our university president, Michael Young, has, has made a very strong commitment to freedom of speech. Um, we had a, actually, we had a really bizarre sequence of events these last few months. President Young in August said, we are not the kind of university that disinvites campus speakers just because people don't like them or they're not politically correct or whatever, which I thought was commendable, right? Then we had one of the more vile speakers I've ever heard of actually showed up at Texas A&M in early December, uh, Richard Spencer, who is a, he's a white nationalist. There's no other way to say it. And um, the A&M community uh, responded by by having what I thought was a fairly, you know, they, they still allowed him to present. They had protests and things like that, but free speech, free speech, it was good, as opposed to setting their own campus on fire like what happened at Berkeley. So I, I thought I thought the response across the board uh, spoke well of our campus. So, yeah. I, I will say in general, though, academia is a pretty godless place, even at a, even in the Bible Belt. That was true at Texas Tech as well. I was, a, I was a faculty member at Tech for several years. One thing I noticed at Texas Tech is there are a lot of professors who, because they knew the students were coming from the Bible Belt, they had an extra chip on their shoulder and really went out of their way to try to nail Christians to the wall. So, yeah. Another question. Yeah, one more. Um. I just have a question of clarification. I was taking notes. Yep. I'm a note taker. God bless you. <laughs> so you said something here. I'm going to sit down so I can look at my notes. Um, is that okay? Yeah, no, yeah that's okay. Um, 
let's see here. So you, you mentioned sense perception, the reliability, cognitive reliability, mm-hmm. and the universe is orderly and understandable as assumptions for science. Right. And then you went on to speak about uh, the problems with those assumptions, right? Yeah, on, on, on naturalism. On right. naturalism, yeah. right. Reductionism or non-reductionism. Mm-hmm. You said that with non-reductionism, uh, naturalism might be able to explain sense perception as a necessary component. Oh, uh, yeah, I should, I should clarify. So reductionism was the idea that we're just atoms, and there's, that's, it can be reduced to atoms, and that's all there is. And I think even the reductionists would say our sense perception is at least good enough to keep us alive, right? So our sense perception is accurate enough so that we can survive and reproduce. Um, the non-reductionist people, the non-reductionist naturalists, I think are spouting nonsense. I think when they go non-reductionist and say things like emergent and su- properties supervene, I-, I think they may as well be saying magic. You know, so I don't, I don't think they know what they're talking about for sure on that front. So the question I had is what is the difference between uh, sense perception and cognitive reliability? Because you, you differentiated between the two. There are three points. R- right, right. So, so. Sense, sense perception would be something like, uh, like let's imagine I uh, – let me think of a good example. Let's imagine I'm a mouse, okay? I'm a mouse and I have eyeballs and I see a cat and the cat is coming after me. Now, if my sense perception is good, then my eyeballs are accurate at gauging. The cat is yay far away and it's coming at me at yay speed, right? Now, cognitive reliability, that may be that, like, my little mousy brain doesn't really know why. Maybe I think the cat is, you know, who knows what I believe about the cat? I can believe any number of things about that cat, it doesn't matter what I believe about the cat as long as I run away. So truth doesn't really matter. As long as like my re- reaction is thing, cat, run away, my understanding of the cat's intentions or what would actually happen to me, my ability to understand truth, is like it doesn't really matter. If I have a wrong truth idea, but as long as I behave in the right way, that behavior, that, that brain synapse will still be uh, uh, reinforced and reintroduced. And actually naturalists talk this way all the time about human beings. They say, you, you have this particular way of thinking, but you only evolved that in, in regard to some pressure, but it's not actually true and it's not actually logical. It's just something that got hardwired into your brain uh, by evolution, even though it's false. So they would make those kind of claims about you, which, of course, they should make that claim about themselves, too. Right? So that's the distinction between sense perception and cognitive reliability. Yeah. Lots and lots of atheists have brought up that problem um, that they say, like, uh, they, they, they say... Uh, natural selection is great at producing things that know how to find food, that know how to to find a mate and reproduce. They can survive. They can do all these things. But being able to think uh, about metaphysical realities, like how does that help you survive and reproduce? You may as well be a cockroach. Cockroach is much better than we are at surviving and reproducing. So what good do our, our two truth-telling abilities really do? You know, so, yeah. Okay, we have time for a couple Doctor, so you did an admirable job uh, thank you. explaining the uh, refutations and the inconsistencies. So where are we with the great scientists, the honest scientists that are on the frontier of knowledge and frontier of discovery and research? Where are we in that discussion with them on these self-refuting statements? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Well, when you, start, when you first started asking the question, like, great scientists on the edge of discovery, I was like, well, you are in for a treat because one of them will be here in two weeks. Uh, Dr. Tour is, like, like uh, Jarrett said, is one of the, the greatest scientists in the world. Um, I, I will tell you, and this is to the shame of science, many of the greatest scientists out there are pretty poor philosophers, right? Um, yeah, like, I mean, if you go, so I'll just give you an example. So Richard Dawkins has quite the pedigree from a biology standpoint and understands his biology pretty well. But then he goes and he writes his books and he's like, you know what? If there was really a God, then why would there be all this evil in the world? And the Christians say, tell me something I haven't been hearing for the last 800 years, right? And, and, and Dawkins is, is like, I'm discovering something no one's ever thought of before. And so he's showing that he's a freshman philosophy major, right? He may be a very great expert when it comes to biology, but when it comes to his understanding of, you know, theodicy and problem of evil and stuff like that, he literally is the same as a freshman philosophy major. So, so expertise in one area does not necessarily guarantee expertise in another area. And honestly, a lot of us, like, we get, it's, you, you wouldn't believe how subdivided we get, where we are an expert in this tiny, itty-bitty little thing. 
And so those of you who are parents of high schoolers and you're thinking about college, recognize, by the way, that the way universities used to be is your son or daughter would go off to college and be kind of a Renaissance man, a Renaissance woman, and have a pretty good, broad understanding of history, philosophy, science, all these things. But the nature of the world is kind of pushing it to where you get into this tiny little itty-bitty major. And so as you look ahead, one of the things to take into account is how can I kind of get the best of both, best of, both of those worlds when I look at, at college opportunities? Oh, sure. Go ahead. So, so one of your first slides, and repeated several times, was the blue bar, yeah. mostly light blue, that right. we know, and dark right. blue. And the assumption was give us enough time, and that dark blue gets smaller and smaller. You right. showed a couple examples where that block, dark blue you're never going to answer. Right. But one of the things is sometimes time, because it's the spear back at yourself. For example, you mentioned Darwin. Darwin recognized that the fossil record did not really adequately you know, answer all the questions or answer all the, give all the solutions to what he thought was evolution. But he believed that given enough time, 150 years later, we'll have a better fossil record and therefore we'll know more. And it's turned out to be actually the opposite. It's actually gotten worse than right. better because of the fossil record. Same is also true, for example, junk DNA. Oh, absolutely, right. yeah. It used to be junk DNA. We thought, man, we're 99.5% similar to monkeys, and now due to better sequencing, we now know it maybe 85% or something like that. Right. So how do your other scientists, when you approach them from that perspective, answer these type of questions? Time has actually made it worse, not better for them. Oh, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I don't know how they would respond, but I agree with you that if, you, if we really wanted to do a good job, good job of showing the bar, the little light blue bar would be getting bigger as we get additional knowledge. But then as we get additional knowledge, we realize like, oh, crud. There's actually the, the amount that we thought we didn't know or didn't understand is much bigger than what we originally thought it was. And so the gap is getting uh, bigger over time, not smaller. The origin of life is probably the best example of that. The more we learn about the origin of life, the more we say like, oh, crud, this really can't work. Um, I appreciate that particular one because I do a lot of computer programming. And the analogies between computer programming and DNA are so... They're so perfect. They line up really well. Um, and when you think about the fact that we have ribosomes, which is like a translator between DNA code and then machine code of proteins, it's unbelievable how complex and difficult it is. And someone like Darwin would have had no idea. Um, anyway, when, you, when you, you asked how do fellow scientists react when you, when you approach them with that, they're so entrenched in, in naturalism that they say, well, what else are we going to do? Like, so they, they, tend to, they tend to punt, and they definitely don't want to let anything supernatural in the door. Um, what's interesting, I, I mentioned uh, uh, Francis Crick. Um, he has actually opened the door a little bit on the intelligent design front, not meaning God, but meaning aliens from other world, like actually seeded the earth. So that shows you kind of how desperate people can get on occasion on a topic like the origin of life. Yes, sir. I know we're, we're, we have like two minutes. If that clock is accurate, then we have like two minutes and then we... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're on Pacific time, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Christians believe that uh, God created the heavens and the earth and all good things. And so in my mind, that leaves a little slack for the evolutionists. They created all bad things. For example, I heard one example was in a depression in a rock on a mountain, there was some warm water, muddy and a cosmic particle came down and struck the water and out popped Dennis Kucinich. <laughs> right. So, so we, can we have that kind of evolution? Uh, this is, so uh, this is an interesting question of like, so the creation of, by the way, this, so the, the question was kind of joking, but it is true that like the creation evolution question is somewhat bound up with the problem of evil. Right. So I'll, I'll just tell you, I kind of grew up from, in, in a very young earth perspective and I've since... Um, relaxed a little bit and decided, like, eh, you know, the, the Christians disagree and, you know, maybe it's okay. Be nice to each other, please, you know, that sort of thing. But um, the, the, much of the motivation, the reason people are on edge when you discuss the creation and evolution question is because the problem of evil is a real problem, right? You have to say, whence evil? Did God create the world including evil? If there's evolution and animal death, is that evil? Does that count? And I, actually, I don't, I don't think I, I have home run answers for that kind of thing, but I, I would encourage you to think it through. Um, I, I actually, I wondered, I was like, what do young earth creationists think about, about 
evil and like, because sometimes you see what clearly seems to be uh, design for some animal to like horribly maim another animal, right? And so how do they account for that? And uh, I, I recently saw an article where they actually said maybe God knew the fall was coming, so he pre-designed in snakes to be able to inject venom and sharks to be able to chomp on other things. But I don't know. It's a, I, I don't think there are clean answers to those kind of problems. There's not a home run. So with that in mind, if you run into a Christian who believes differently than you do on the creation evolution questions, do be kind to one another because it's not, it's not as easy as you may think. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Be nice. Yeah, exactly. So how do, how do the nat- naturalists, by the way, thank you, this has been wonderful. Um, Thanks. H- how does the naturalist deal with the exceptions to known, um, s- s- um, I guess, trends in, in natural laws and science, such as when ice freezes, it, it becomes less dense as it approaches a freezing temperature, and that seems to be somewhat of an exception in material science, and if it were not the case, um, we'd all be in a frozen wasteland, or you know, these molecular forces that seem to be unexplained, a strong force. And um, Have you ever been in a discussion with a naturalist and maybe touched on some of those things and, and, and gotten a response? Uh, I don't know if I've, we've gotten, so the, the, the ice freezing thing I think is, is fairly well understood, but some of these other ones like, if it wasn't this way, we would all be dead. That to me kind of all fall, falls under the rubric of fine tuning. There's so many things about our planet and about the universe that it's like if you change just one, that, that constant, just a tiny little bitty bit, then life would be impossible. Or you'd have a, uh, doctor, like I said, Dr. Luke Barnes was on our campus recently, and he said, if you tweak this constant just a shade, then chemistry exams become very easy because the question would be, what is the element? Hydrogen. <laughs> what is the reaction? H plus H goes to H2, and that's it. You have a whole universe and nothing but hydrogen. And so... So when you start doing that, natural, I'll just say naturalists get nervous when you start asking questions relating to fine-tuning. And um, some naturalists say, well, you can't really tell the difference between fine-tuning and coarse-tuning. I don't, I don't know about that. But, uh, mo- the most common response from naturalists has been to say, well, how do we know there's not an infinite number of universes? Have you all heard of that before? It's called the multiverse? Yeah. So they'll say, maybe there's an infinite number of universes and we're just in the lucky one. Um, to me, you, they're, if, once they've done stuff like that, um, I don't know why they're pretending to not be religious because that's a religious statement, effectively. That's, that's not science. It's speculative. There's no evidence for it. So anyway, yeah. Let me ask just one final question, you Dr. Bet. Green, as we wrap up here. We are in a very interesting place and time, I think, in, in history with mm. uh, the discussion and debate around science and all the type of things that we've been uh, discussing here tonight, uh, both in your presentation and the questions. W- where are we going? Where, if you could describe, look into your crystal ball, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, where will the state of this discussion and debate be? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so the philosophical arguments, in some sense, don't change. You know, I talked about the cosmological argument, and you can argue and learn and think about that, and all of a sudden you find yourself saying, Oh, Thomas Aquinas said this 800 years ago. Oh, okay, great. So the, the philosophical arguments, to me, uh, continue. Um, I think one thing that's been really good recently, and I think this will continue, is as if, if Christians can be thought leaders, if Christians can get out there and say, we're, we're, going, we're not going to abandon the sciences, but we're going to try to get into the sciences and do the best science that we can, that tends to break down a lot of stereotypes and break down resistance to the gospel. Um, Generally, just culturally, where are we headed? Um, uh, de- the demographics tend to show that inherited religion is on the decline. You know the people who are like, well, my grandma was a Christian, so I'm a Christian too, I guess, whatever. And, and then they go, to Chris- they go to church on Christmas and Easter. That's going away. But chosen religion, people who are like, I believe this because I really do believe it, not just because that's part of my culture, I think that's going to continue. And so the, the line between... Christians and non-Christians, between believers and non-believers, I think is going to become a little more sharp, less of that fuzzy cultural Christian middle, which is maybe an inconvenient thing. It may make life a little more difficult when you go off to college. You may feel a little more lonely and a little more persecuted. But in another sense, it's actually very good, right? It makes very clear delineations between, uh, between Christians and non-Christians. One example I can give you is my own, uh, my own educational experience. Um, I did my undergrad at Texas Tech. Bible Belt, your average student on campus, if you said, are you a Christian? They'd be like, yeah. 
that may not be true, but at least they would self-identify as a Christian. I went to grad school at MIT, and uh, a lot of my fellow students at MIT would be like, a Christian, I've never seen one in the wild before. Hmm. Like, they're, but they were very intrigued, and, they, and you could have a legitimate conversation with them, right? At, at Texas Tech, if you try to share the gospel with someone, they're like, yeah, 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 my grandma told me that, I know, and they, you off, they blow you off. At MIT, they'd be like, I've never heard that before, huh? And so I think what, what I saw at MIT, what I saw on the East Coast, that's progressing across the country. And so, so what you see in the big cities on the East Coast, that's what Texas will be like 10 or 15 years from now, maybe less. And if I'm going to give a book recommendation, I had toyed around at one point with the idea of writing a book. And then a few months ago, I read the book Making Sense of God by Tim Keller. And I thought, well, I don't need to write a book anymore. He already wrote whatever I would have said. He said it a thousand times better. He's been a pastor in Manhattan for decades. So he's always kind of seen the cultural vanguard. And he makes a lot of the exact same points here. And basically what Keller says is people may buy into some of these concepts, but it's not ultimately satisfying. Um, and so well, they're, they're going to be searching for answers. And I think that the, the church can be a real... Um, a, a real standout be something that stands in stark contrast to everything around it in that context. So, yeah. All right. That was we, rambling, but you get the idea. That was great. Uh, would you, yeah. would you join, join me in thanking Dr. Green? Thank you. Thank you. And I believe our Katie location wanted to say something as well. Oh, no. <laughs> howdy, howdy. Howdy, howdy. All right. All right. Hey, wait a minute. I know, I know you. Uh, we just wanted to say, uh, we don't have any profound questions. We just wanted to say you helped us a lot when we were there. And we, uh, we love you, and uh, we, uh, we think you're just awesome. Oh, I appreciate it. The, these, these poor souls had me in class. <laughs> they, they've had, right. Anyway, now, now they're off making more money than they deserve and, you know, all that kind of thing. So, yeah. Now, don't whoop. If you whoop, in ch- every, if you whoop in church, every time you whoop in church, Reveille gets a flea. Right? That's just, uh, well, that's just science. You shouldn't do it. Yeah. That's, a, that's a problem with this particular church anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that happens quite a bit. Yeah, I understand. All, All right. right. Well, thank you so thank much you, again, uh, Dr. Green. Dr. Green will be around for just a few minutes uh, as, we, as we close here. Let me just remind you, again, uh, the next two Tuesday nights, Dr. Walter Bradley uh, and then um, Dr. Jim Tour back here uh, at Faith Bible Church Live, and once again, simulcast uh, to the Katy location. Thank you, all those in Katy, for joining us tonight, and, and thank you all for coming here. Drive safe on the way home. Thanks. Thanks.